project and how inductive invariants help compute, help prove assertions that should be true on the contract level concerning an unbounded number of transactions. So this is all implemented inside a split compiler in the module called SMT Checker, which runs if you use a program experimental SMT Checker and simply run the compiler. So the static analysis trying to prove that the assertions you have in your contract are never violated no matter the number of um, transactions. So first, I'm going to start with a demo. Um, the screen's kind of small, I'm not sure if you guys can read this, but I have a really tiny contract that, that sort of emulates a really a toy state machine. So I have a state variable x, a function f that changes x from 0 to 1, so x starts with 0 in the constructor. Um, g changes 1 back to 0, so you have the state machine that starts with 0, and then you can go to 1 and go back to 0 and just like, keep doing this forever. And then I have this third function called invariant that asserts that x less or equal 1. And this, this function variant is public, so whenever you call it, it should be true, otherwise, otherwise it's going to be work, right? Um, so do you think this assertion is true? So because of the implicit constructor, x is initialized at 0, right? So it will start at 0, you might go to 1 if you call f, you might go back to 0 if you call g after calling f. So it is true, right? right? It should be true. Yeah. And this is what the SMT checker is going to try to prove, that that assertion is always true. Um, so if we look at this program as the actual state machine, as this control flow graph, we have the constructor initialize x with 0, and then it goes to this block called this artificial node that I call the interface, which is the idle state of the, of the smart contract, right? It doesn't have an active um, execution, you have to call it. So it stays in this interface until you call a function from the contract, which could be f, g, or invariant. So f changes, might change x, uh, goes back to the interface, g is saying an invariant can go to sync error state if the assertion is false. So what the SMT checker is going to try to do is statically see if we can have a path from the constructor all the way to the error state. And for that, you might actually go through this loop a bunch of times, right? So it's going to try to see if you can get from the constructor to the error state, no matter the number of transactions you might have to go through. So I'm going to try it. So this is... Um, yeah, this is the code, it's basically the same code. Um, and I'm just going to run the compiler on it. And it does not say that it's wrong, therefore it's false. It's, uh, sorry, it's, it does not say it's wrong, therefore it's safe. But the compiler also outputs a bunch of weird stuff. That still looks ugly, but it's going to look nice eventually. But as part of it, what it tells us is this thing here. So what this is telling us, this is a contract invariant because it's an invariant on um, on the interface node. So what this is telling us is that on the interface node, it's always true for all values that x can have that x is less than two, right? And because we're talking about integers, this means it's it's the same as at x less or equal one, right? Which in this case is. Um, which in this case is the same um, as our assertion here. But if we change the code slightly here, so I added this function h, that now it's a new, it's a new rule in our safe machine that says, now if x equals 7, make it 100. And then I change the assertion to x less or equal 7. Um, is the assertion correct? Yeah. Exactly, right? So this is a weird local state, but considering the global contract state, it's useless, right? Um, but still, we try to prove the assertion anyway, and when we do that, the compiler also says it's safe, and it also gives us a bunch of information again about things that are true at certain points in the contract flow graph. And similarly, we can check what's going on with the interface node. And it gives us the same invariant again. 
So before I tried to prove x less or equal 1, and it gave me x less or equal 1. So it learned that. But now I'm trying to prove x less or equal 7, and it still gives me x less or equal 1, even though I'm trying to prove something else. Um, so both these two properties are invariants of the contract, right? So the compiler proved that they are true, but they have to be different somehow. So what is the difference between x less or equal 2 and x less or equal 7? You know the answer, ever. It doesn't count. Well, 7 minus 2 is 5. That's true. <laughs> um, so to check the difference, uh, to understand what's fundamentally different in this case between x less or equal 2 and x less or equal 7, we need to analyze each of those invariants with respect to each function separately without considering the rest of the state of the contract. So we analyze each invariant only looking at the function, each function, without caring as if any other, as if the other functions don't really exist at all. So if you plug in this invariant before the body of f and then after as a post condition for f, does the invariant still hold after f? It does, right? Because, it, because even if it changes, it still holds. And same here, right? This also holds. It's less or equal 7. If you change it to 1, it still holds. What about g? This invariant still holds, right? So even if it was 1, which would fit the invariant, if you change it to 0, it still holds. And it's the same here for 7. You use it as precondition, even if you change it, it still holds. But now here's the catch. So he, here for x less or equal 2, for the artificial useless function that I added, um, if, you, if we execute this function in this, with this invariant, is it, is it still true afterwards? It is, right? So here you can see that x less or equal 2 really makes this function useless because it's not really going to be changed. But with this invariant, we see that the invariant does not hold after the function is locally executed when you use the invariant itself as a precondition. So this, what this tells us is basically that x less or equal 2 is inductive, whereas x less or equal 7 is not. And what that means on a higher level is that if you take the invariant, and conjoin it with the local behavior of the function alone without caring about the rest, the invariant should still hold after that execution. This is what differentiates an inductive invariant from a normal invariant. So the inductive will has to be true after the execution as well. So it implies itself with the, with the variables being in the next state. So indu inductive invariance is, sorry. Actually, if you go back to that previous slide. Yeah. Uh, one more. So in this, right, um, if x is a public variable, I can straight change the variable to maybe 7 and then... Uh, oh, but uh, the contract, so... Sorry? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah this is the contract. Okay, so it's not public. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the variable's not. But even if it's public, you couldn't change it, right? If the variable is declared public, you got a, you got a public getter, but you can't change it by the getter. Okay. You would need... Okay. Uh, can you show the code with the 7 in it again? So how, so here you're starting with the invariant x is less than or equal to 7, but how does it learn the 2 invariant, the actual inductive invariant? Because these two are the only ones that, that hold, right? That, that, that really matter. But I just don't see 2 anywhere in the code here, so where does it come up with 2? Oh, with the 1 here. It's less than 2 because of integers. It's less or equal 1 or less than 2, right? I guess I'm just not understanding, is it like a heuristic it picks up, or is it just picking a model, or how is it, is Z3 just picking a model that says 2 is the smallest number I can find that it's true for, or how does it come up with 2 specifically? It because that's the, because that's the inductive one. The others are not inductive. Huh? Whatever you pick greater than 2 is not going to be inductive. Okay. I think he's asking a lower level question, which is algorithmically, how do I write a solver? Like this, <laughs> that can from this code. No, but the, not the reason the character two. Yeah, but right. yeah, but the reason for that is that it looks for inductive invariants. But three would be inductive too, right? Like if you were to say x less than three. Three would be inductive, yeah. Yeah. So why doesn't it pick three? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably right. It's probably it probably looks for the strongest one. Okay. Yeah, because three would be weaker than two. Yeah. In the sense that x less or equal to two would imply. But it's, there's no algorithm you wrote that does that. Choose. Oh no, so I didn't write that. So that comes from 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 some Yeah. Okay. Any other questions here? 
Okay. So loop invariants, uh, sorry, inductive invariants, um, they're used to summarize a relevant piece of code without really caring about the rest of the code. So you're interested in a single piece of code and you want to summarize that. And you might, if you might have information or you might not have information about the rest of the program. Right? So you want to summarize that little bit. Um, and this is particularly and actually classically useful for loops, right? Because loops are the core of the challenges in formal verification, right? That's the that's the termination part. That's why you don't really know how how to solve it in a nice way. So we try to not we like just people in general have tried to summarize loops um, in a way that you can still go on and and prove your your program. So now I'm going to show a little loop example. Is this assertion correct? It is, right? Um, yeah, so they're unsigned integers, so the least, the, the least value is zero, so that's safe. But I'm going to run the compiler anyway. And it tells us it's safe, and also a bunch more stuff. And, but if we look for the information that it gives us about the loop header, we see this. So this is an invariant on the loop header. And this is an inductive, inductive invariant for the loop. And this says that, so this is actually y and this is x. So this is telling me y less or equal x. And here we see that the condition is y less than x. So the difference between these two is that y less or equal x is an inductive invariant on the loop. It, it still holds after the, the loop is executed. So y less or equal x is the core property of, of, this, of this loop here. Um, and after the loop, in the control flow of this program, the condition of the loop has to be false, right? At this point here in the code, this has to be false. Otherwise, it would still be in the loop, correct? So we have that this is also true at that point, y greater or equal x, which is a negation um, of this condition here. So if we have these two things together, we can imply that y equals x, right? So deriving an inductive invariant for the loop right away enables us to prove a property um, that heavily uses the computation of the, of the loop. And in that matter, inductive invariants can also be used to prove recursive programs where you can plug the inductive invariant as the inductive hypothesis of um, the recursive function. But then how exactly does the, how exactly do the inductive invariants help us prove contracts, help us prove contract invariants, so invariants that hold on the contract level state variables, so invariants that are true before and after the execution of any public function. And here when I, when I, when I say invariants, I actually mean contract invariants in this sense, before and after each function, and not the classical invariant um, definition that it has to be true at every program counter. So as I showed in the beginning, you can model the contract as this control flow here containing a loop, right? Where you go to the interface after the constructor and you always go back to the interface after the execution of a public function. And here, the really nice thing about this, um, this way of modeling it, or this way of seeing it, is that we can model each of these transitions from these nodes to horn clauses. Horn clauses are Four sort of logic formulas that have a very particular shape. This one, it's an implication where the hat or the implied part of the implication is then here going to be the predicate of the block we're going to, where the parameters are here are the state variables, right? So here, x is going to be um, the parameter for all my all my, my predicates here, and the predicate is true if that the predicate is true for a certain value if that block is reachable for that um, value for x. Um, the rest of the horn plots here, on the left side of the implication we have constraints, and here I get constraints from the execution of the constructor, and the predicate of the block I'm coming from, also on the, vari on the variables um, that, uh, the value that entered that block. Yeah, so if there's only one predicate on the left side, this is called a linear word clause. 
And if there, there is, there's more than one, it's still a horn clause, but it's called a nonlinear horn clause. And it's a lot harder to solve. And this is just an example of a bunch of other rules that we generate from um, encoding this, this control flow graph into horn clauses. Not all of them are here. This is just to show some of them. But for lack of time, I'm not going to go um, by each of them. We can talk later. OK, so as I mentioned before, the problem that we're trying to solve is can we get from the constructor to the error state? And in the first example that I showed, the error state was unreachable. Um, and the way it finds out is that all these green nodes form a fixed point where every transition leads to a node that is already in that set. So you never get out of that set, and you finally see that the error state is not reachable at all. And this is all possible um, because of this really nice encoding that we can do directly from the control flow graph to the horn clauses, which looks very, very, very similar. And this is only possible because of these two results. So we, got, we go um, all the way from horror logic to um, ex existential positive least fixed point logic, um, which is actually what we're doing. But there is a connection between this logic and constraint horn clauses, which gives us this really nice encoding. But what if now I change uh, my first example from g changing y from 1 to 0 to 2 now, um, is the error state still unreachable? Or is it reachable? It is. It's, it is. It's reachable, right? Um, yeah, so I'm just going to run it quickly. <laughs> And here it says, yeah, it's reachable, your assertion is wrong. Um, X can also be 2, and what it also tells us, and this is going to look better eventually, but which is really important, is these things here. This is telling us backwards which transactions or which loop iterations led to that reachable. And this is just encoding of that thing. So, but this is telling us that we can call invariant and make, it, make the error reachable, but if, because X is 2, there was a transaction that made X2. Before that, there was a transaction that made X1. And before that, there was a transaction that made X0. And if we look back in the, in the graph, so he, this would be the first one. So we deploy the contract, right? So X is 0. So this is the flow that we go through from constructor to interface. The next one we call function F, which then changes X from 1 to 0. And we're back at the interface. The next one, G, changes it to 2. Now we finally call function invariant and reach the error, where the sequence here is deployment f g and invariant. So this is how the SMT checker does things. And in the back end, it uses um, these tools called horn solvers, which is similar to similar in a way to SMT solvers. It also uses SMT solvers. And horn solvers basically they take all these rules that I that I wrote and a reachability query, so you say, can I get to, to uh, predicate error? And it tells you yes or no. And the way these horn solvers do this is you can use predicate abstraction, all these this, um, techniques here. But the one we use is actually a tool called Spacer that does SMT based unbound model checking with a technique called PDR, meaning property direct reachability. What it does is from the error state, it tries to, does a backward reachability check trying to get all the way to the constructor, which is the only fact, it's the only predicate that is not actually implied by any other predicate. And um, it does that by generating a bunch of quantifier-free SMT queries and then invoke an SMT solver and use interpolation as, uh, as a method for abstraction to find predecessors in the state, doing the backwards eligibility, and generate new lemmas and invariants. So this is implemented in the Solidity compiler, in the, in the model, module called SMT Checker. Um, by now, there's a lot of support to the language. There's a few things missing, but it can already verify a lot of things. Um, and this um, module, this part of it, the horn-based algorithms, can already find bugs or prove invariants for um, multi-transaction properties, so multi-transaction safety properties, um, but there's still things missing. So what's next? Function calls are really important, and we want to do that by creating what we call function summaries. So you create those function summaries, 
and then you can assert that that summary is true for a certain set of variables. And this can also be nice to show that there's no changes in the state of the color contract. So this is, of course, related to re-entrancy. Um, synthesis of external functions that you don't have access to the code might also be nice when generating kind of examples. This all would lead to um, the possibility of verifying really complex contracts and, and setups. When you, like, when you have multi-contract, uh, multi-transaction properties that might be really hard to find otherwise. And maybe eventually model the entire state of the, of the blockchain. Another thing is showing nicer looking counterexamples and invariants. So I showed like all the output from the compiler. So that's of course I had to change something internally to output all that stuff. That's not supposed to show all that that way. So it has to be nicer. Better usability in terms of um, right now the only way to use a synthetic checker is actually compiling the compiler yourself with C3 or CVC4 linked to it, but we are working on having it enabled via SolCJS and the JavaScript version, which I guess is what most people use via the via JavaScript frameworks. And we're, we are also working with other people from consensus runtime verification and other projects on creating a very, very simple um, specification, formal specification language. And we welcome anyone and everyone to be part of um, creating this language. It's, we are discussing things in this repo. So feel free to come in and give ideas. So finally, to conclude my talk, so SMC solvers are very powerful and very fast. At least we try to sell them that way. Um, eventually, they'll stop being that fast because we try too hard. Um, and the technique we use here is PDR. It's an unbounded model checking technique to solve the horn clauses that model our control flow graph. And the goal we have here is to prove that safety properties are sound even when you consider an unbounded number of, um, of transactions. This is all um, in the Solidity compiler. You get it for free simply by using the Pragma Experimental Safety Checker, but you need to have assertions. So it's a property directed reachability, as I mentioned before, so it needs to have a property to verify. It's not going to tell you random things just out of the code itself. You need to have safety properties um, in the program. Um, and finally, the contract inductive invariance that we generate and would output from the compiler can also help verification of bytecode afterwards, which uh, sometimes is a lot harder. Thank you, everyone. Do we have time for questions? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So only asserts work or also requires would be So requires are used as assumptions. Okay. Yeah. And so right now this only works at the level of a single contract and you're working to yeah. extend the multi-contract yeah. interactions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. How about before we also have to like put assertions in for that or well if you have assertions in the first contract and you're calling a second contract. The difference is that the second contract might do things you're not really don't really know what it's doing, or sometimes you do, and there might be a reentrancy things that changes the state of the first contract and then would affect the property that you want to prove afterwards. So, yeah, this is this is how it can change, but by now it's mostly uh, uh, implementation effort. Just uh, put it in the code. Thanks, everyone.